Hello, today we're continuing with our look at the evolution of character design within Final Fantasy, with a look at the Final Fantasy VIII protagonist, Squall Leonhardt. Now, I've very consciously chosen Squall as the first major case study in this series, because he came at a very particular time and place in Final Fantasy's evolution as a game series, and as such, I think he represents a lot about where the personnel working on the series wanted to go with it uh, post-Sakaguchi and coming more into this Yoshinori Katase sort of era, the modernization of Final Fantasy, really, which I think Squall is, is very representative of, as we'll see in this breakdown. So, jumping right in, uh, we're going to look at other versions of Squall that came in later games and spin-offs, but first off, we're going to break down the fundamentals of his design as he appeared in Final Fantasy VIII proper. And right off the bat, I think if we compare Squall to everything that came previously, there is a very stark shedding of the characteristically Japanese approaches to JRPG character design that was prevalent at this particular time. So looking back to early Final Fantasy games, we had concept art and, and this work being done Firstly, in the floating world style of, of Yoshitaka Amano, and then in the later renders, uh, we had this quintessentially Japanese chibi form, which most of the Final Fantasy characters were rendered as uh, in, in the early games. And then in Final Fantasy VII, which was the first game in which character design was helmed fully by Tetsuya Nomura, we had him designing in this classically anime-leaning sort of way with the large-eyed characters, uh, minimal detailing to the nose and mouth, and so on. So, by contrast, if we look at Final Fantasy VIII from the concept art onwards, it was quite a departure with these designs that emerged from, from admittedly quite anime-leaning concepts in early games. And actually, if you look at the really early concept work in Final Fantasy VIII, you can see a hint of the large-eyed anime vibe there. But it evolved into a much more figurative and realistic approach in terms of how it designed its characters. A perfect case in point being the beautiful pencil portraits that Tetsuya Nomura did that eventually found their way into the game as the menu headshots. And we can quite clearly see here that contrary to the reductive anime style, which for example just had a line for the mouth or a triangle of shadow to denote the nose, uh, Squall Leonhardt here has been very attentively rendered almost as if it was a, a life drawing or something like that. You know, wonderful shading across the nose and, and, and the mouth and, and, and bits like that. And I think the reason for this, beyond merely cosmetic choice and where they wanted to go with Final Fantasy VIII, which I will come to, is that because technology had improved so much um, and, and they had the ability to, for example, have these advanced FMV cutscenes like the ballroom dance with Renoa and, and that sort of thing, and even having Squall's features visible in the field screen, which was now possible, there was probably a necessity to have more detailed concept art uh, as a result of that, because the developers would need to reference something to be able to program it and, and render it as an FMV, for example. And I think this is further exemplified by the wealth of 3D rendered concept art that was actually published alongside Final Fantasy VIII. And that wasn't really a thing prior to this point in 1999-2000, in I think this really started to take off in the first decade of the 2000s when pen and paper concept art, 2D concept art, was sort of diminishing and, and being used less and certainly being published less. And then games to be promoted and marketed were, were using much more 3D stuff, uh, which I always felt was a bit of a shame, really, because I do love pen and paper concept art, particularly coming out of the Final Fantasy series. So... A figurative approach to designing Squall was a big deal, uh, and it was something that we also see translate over into his rendering in the game world, because unlike, again, every Final Fantasy that came previous to this, Final Fantasy VIII was also a milestone entry for having realistically proportioned characters uh, across the field screen, the battle screen, and the world map screen for the very first time. And relating back to this series trajectory, I think the first inkling of where we are at with the series today with these super realistic, plausibly human characters inhabiting plausible worlds. I think the first time this was really attempt, attempted and, 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 and striven towards was in the work that went into Final Fantasy VIII, and specifically the character designs there. So, very non-Japanese approach to concept art, 
uh, figur- figuratively proportioned characters being big major shifts here in the design of Squall, the hero. Moving on to the characteristics of Squall himself, uh, we do have the obligatory vol- voluminous and disarrayed haircut, uh, and there is a long-running trend of this in Final Fantasy heroes. Uh, it's one of the things, along with his personality, that many used to lump him in with Cloud Strife as a sort of character comparison in the past. But firstly, I think the hair helps with Squall's silhouetting. Um, it's a unique attribute that really distinguishes him at first glance from other characters in the game. And secondly, unlike Cloud Strife, it is a considerably more plausible haircut that we might see in the real world. I mean, it is still quite abstracted, but it's not a million miles away from reality. And actually, at the time of Final Fantasy VIII's release, there was a big deal being made of the real-world references um, that had been noted in, in the design of the characters. And I think the, the late River Phoenix is said to have been the basis for Squall's design. The rest of Squall's face has some narrative significance, and actually one of the criticisms that some level at Final Fantasy VIII is the homogenous nature of the character designs, and indeed in the headshots they each have these designs that taper off into long necks <laughs> that does look quite similar you know, across the board. Although for some reason, and I never understood why, Quistis, her portrait is facing right while all the others are facing left. Uh, not sure what that is. But Squall specifically has a visual similarity to Laguna, most specifically in the shade and shape of the eyes, because of course they are alluded heavily to being father and son, and of course they are. And also he has some visual similarities to Cypher, who is his sort of major foil in this game, because they both have kind of symmetrical scars going across their forehead, which was uh, obtained in the opening FMV during their duel. So some quite conscious design decisions being made that do play out into the game events and, and have a reason for being there in terms of the characters looking quite homogenous. Coming to the attire of Squall, this is also notable because unlike many heroes before or since, Squall has no overt call signs of a classic fantasy protagonist, and indeed rather than armour or braces or accessories that would mark him out as a soldier or a warrior like Cloud Strife or Furion for example, or other elements that nod to a character class or skill set that we might find in JRPGs, like Lock Cole or Zidane Tribal, if we took away Squall's Gunblade, he might not strike us as a warrior at all, uh, and he began this spell of heroes, such as Tidus, such as Noctis, who have clothing that is actually quite contemporary and realistically relatable, maybe, rather than anything that was overtly fantasy or medieval or whatever. So I think this relates to the high school setting, where most of our party are indeed wearing casual clothing, and while he isn't your run-of-the-mill armour-wearing sort of warrior, I do think it was an effective design that reflected more about Squall's personality than necessarily his role or his class in the story. For example, he has this very distinctive fur-lined collar that, as has been noted in the past, Tetsuya Nomura designed as a sort of joking challenge to the programmers to try and render it in the FMVs. But I think a subtlety of the white fur, for me at least, is that it conjures ideas of solitary canines, such as wolves or lions, and Squall is certainly a lone wolf through much of this adventure. And with this in mind, we can also note the only other significant accessory that Squall seems to wear, which is the Griever necklace which is itself a symbolic lion-like beast, and bound up with other, other imagery that we have in the game, such as the lion heart limit break, the music, maybe I'm a lion, all of this stuff that orbits and is append- appended to Squall, I think really says a lot about him that is reflected in this very simple uh, design feature of, of the fur on his hood. The other notable accessories to Squall's attire, uh, and have, have what has been quite criticised in the past and joked about as a classic Numura signature, is the belts, and I think Squall in the original game, he seemed to be wearing at least three belts, which has been expanded in Dissidia and future future renditions of him, along with several kind of braces that strap around his, his leg, which as mentioned in my general character design episode, many regard this sort of stuff as superfluous Nomura design, 
Uh, and I agree that this is the case in some instances of Nomura's designs. But equally, I think if we kind of look at these specific characters, looking at their skills, their aptitudes, and indeed the setting of the game, we can often sort of find a reason as to why it might be there. Now, some might not like Squall's design, um, or at least the belts. Um, I personally do. And without even having scrutinised his design, uh, you know, when I first saw him, I really just felt like he came together and it worked together, although I couldn't put my finger on why that was. But to give my two cents worth and a rationale for the belt, I'd note a couple of things that we can take from the game. Firstly, although the field screen animations generally don't show the weapons, we can note that when Squall does draw his sword in cutscenes in the field screen, unlike Cloud Strife, who draws it from a scabbard on his back, Squall draws it from the hip indicating that the gunblade is kept there. So I always took the belts to be some sort of scabbard or holster hybrid that he keeps his sword in that we don't really see. But secondly, uh, and I will come to Squall's gunblade shortly because it is a feature of his design, but we know that the gunblade is a gun as well as a sword. So it requires some sort of ammunition. Um, it has the trigger and the cylinder of a revolver after all. And the brown belts that Squall wears are reminiscent of ammo bandoliers that we see in old western movies and images of cowboys and stuff like that. So again, I feel very subtly the belts work for me because I associate them with somewhere that you might store ammo, uh, as you would in bandoliers. So it ties together with the revolver styling of the gunblade hilt and all of that sort of thing. So whether or not that was the intent of the belts, I'm not sure, but it did always tie from my perspective. Now, a final point on attire. Uh, Squall, I think it's notable, has a very distinct monochrome palette, and I think this is really good because it helps him pop out in the world of Final Fantasy VIII, which for the most part is a very bright, fragrant world. It has the pastel colours of Balam Garden uh, as a prime example, where Squall contrasts quite heavily against that. But also, if we look at the characters that surround him and orbit him, we have Quistis, who wears this coral sort of orange colour, Selfie, who wears yellow, Renoa in light blue, and so on. He really stands out amongst all of these guys, again, because of the monochrome nature of his palette. And I think he contrasts very consciously and, and most significantly with his arch rival, Cypher, who very notably has an inverted colour palette to Squall. So instead of a, a black overcoat, he has a, a white overcoat, he has a dark shirt instead of a white shirt and that sort of thing. And I have mentioned in the past when reviewing Final Fantasy VIII and, and discussing the characters and their roles in the story, I think Cypher and Squall have this very symbiotic yin and yang sort of opposites but similarity sort of thing going on, uh, which is reflected not least in their personalities, but all the way through to these subtleties of design as well. Uh, finally, we have the Gunblade, which I've talked about in the past. Again, I've long admired this as a hero's weapon for quite a few reasons. Uh, the first being that following on from Final Fantasy VII, where we had the iconic Buster Sword, it was interesting to see where Squaresoft would go uh, with their next hero, how they could top such an iconic, aesthetically uh, striking weapon. And, of course, iconic swords are traditional uh, for the heroes in, in myth and legend, and Square has generally committed to this trope, uh, with only a handful of exceptions, like Zidane in Final Fantasy IX and, and, and bits like that. So I wasn't sure, though, where they would go. But I think the Gunblade, on its own merits, looks really cool, uh, fusing this revolver chamber with, with a single-sided broadsword, so sort of like a big sabre. And it works perfectly in this particular setting and for, for Squall's character. Firstly, because we are operating in a, a futuristic setting that nonetheless has knights and magic and sorceresses and this medieval legendary sort of stuff being thrown into it as well. So having a modern weapon like a gun being fused with an archaic weapon like a sword it makes perfect sense. Uh, but also Squall later stating that he'd become a sorceress's knight and stuff like that. Again, not dissimilar from Cypher's arc. It also draws him into this archaic knight class sort of vibe too. And as I say, another yin-yang thing that goes on between Squall and Cypher. Because of course they are the only major wielders of, of a gunblade uh, in this game. Although of course they, they handle it in uniquely different ways. So... That's the attributes of, of Squall's character design in a nutshell. And turning very briefly now to later iterations of Squall, we have some key adaptations in non-canonical games such as Kingdom Hearts, Dissidia, and so on, and also the Final Fantasy VIII remaster. Now, 
Generally speaking, I'm not precious about redesigns, particularly for non-canon games. And regarding both Kingdom Hearts and Dissidia, I really liked, just generally, how they lifted so many heroes and villains out of their own games and worlds and settings, and then fused them together into something new that unified them, in which, by the way, they were designed in, in quite a homogenous way. So Kingdom Hearts, for example, saw Squall adopt a much more Disney-esque sort of aesthetic, along with some distinctive but perhaps only superficial changes, such as giving him long hair, such as giving him cut-off sleeves on his jacket, and, would you believe it, even more belts and braces over his arms and legs. So an interesting rendition of Squall here. But really, actually, I, I think the main addition to his character moving into Kingdom Hearts and these later games was the fact he was voice acted, uh, and I think it's underappreciated how much that can add or, or detract from a character. I think Kingdom Hearts 1 was the first time Squall was voiced, uh, so that's the first time we heard him speaking. Uh, and personally, I, 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 it's my favourite rendition of Squall's voice, and I think it was the Buffy actor David Boreanaz that voiced Squall in that game. Far and away my favourite uh, voice actor for Squall. Moving on to Dissidia, they likewise adopted a more classically Japanese, um, a more classically anime-leaning sort of aesthetic for all of the Final Fantasy characters involved. And in terms of costume, Squall has progressively adopted more accessories in his development compared to the original game, such as the lion belt buckle. There's some fur around his waistband now, and this sort of half cape on his waistband, which seems like another thing that Tetsuya Nomura loves, because... You know, he's added capes to, like, Cloud in Kingdom Hearts and, and stuff like that. But, yeah, all they've done, I think, is accent and double down on the symbolism and the things that defined him in the original game, such as just adding more fur, adding more griever imagery um, than what he had in the first game, and all of that, I think, is fine. Now, finally, coming on to the remaster, I think this divided a lot of people since, contrary to what I mentioned earlier, where Final Fantasy VIII was this huge step towards figurative design and realistic characters, they opted for a more anime aesthetic in the remastered game too. And I think for some characters, uh, like the females, like Qu Quistis, for example, this worked quite well. They look quite cool, in, in my opinion. But really, actually, I think it reduced the impact of Squall as a character because he should be this stoic, stony-faced, serious guy. He has this very distinct kind of human, realistic look. When I think about Squall, I think about that portrait that, that Tetsuya Nomura did right back in Final Fantasy VIII, the original. That's how I envisioned him. So having this anime version sort of jarred with me, and indeed even his very distinct haircut, which again, going back to the silhouetting, is a very important distinctive aspect of, of Squall's character. They've sort of got rid of that and reduced it down to these sort of softened softened uh, facial expressions, these softened kind of haircut, this, these long curtains. It kind of eludes me the decisions behind that. Uh, and I think it shows in an adverse sense how important character design is, how significant and impactful it is uh, when it translates faithfully from concept art onto the screen, uh, which I think the, the original Final Fantasy VIII game did very well. So there we have it, a uh, character design breakdown of Squall, who remains a favourite of mine in the Final Fantasy anthology. Uh, I'm going to continue this mini-series with a look at some other characters in, in the future, but until then, thanks very much for listening. And drop a comment below, let me know what you think on Squall's design.